Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Cindy, alcoholic addict. Hi, Cindy. Cindy. Hi. Uh, I didn't know I was sharing tonight, so here, <laughs> you know, um, I'll just, I'll start with uh, a qualify and tell you, um, my sobriety date is January 18th, 2013. Uh, I have worked these steps. I've done all 12 and uh, started to work them a second time and had a fallout with my sponsor. Um, I'm also in another program with another sponsor, so I am currently in recovery in just just say in a couple of 12 step programs. And, um, and today I have felt, um, so disconnected from my higher power. Um, I'm really sad today. I can really feel my addiction just talking to me, just telling me, just do it, just have one. And the thing is, is I know today that I can't just have one. Um, I was raised in Hayward, and um, I don't know if my parents were alcoholics, but they sure had a lot of parties. There was a lot of alcohol, um, a lot of abandonment. There was a lot of, you know, what they call latchkey. Um, I spent a lot of time alone. Um, um, my first addiction was definitely sugar. I would do go to any lengths to steal money change from my dad to buy candy. And when I got old enough to realize that uh, there was something that could even numb me more, which was alcohol and, and drugs, um, and I and I was funny because I I tried just about everything except heroin because I thought that was addictive. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, but I have tried, you know, and I um, I always struggled with my weight, so when I drank. Um, I would always eat, you know, after I would, you know, get drunk. And so then I realized other forms, um, because I also never could really handle my liquor. I'd be one of those that would drink and then throw up and then clean up and then start over again. And, and that went on and on and on. And, um, and when I found these rooms, um, I got sober at the Vallejo Fellowship, um, I, I currently live in Richmond, but my at the time I was um, detoxing off opiates, and um, because I had been warned prior to a job I had been at for 12 years that um, I had made a scene and, and drank myself into a really uh, blackout of thrashing my hotel room, and mm. my roommate was a co-worker, and she was afraid of me. She was she was my first amends, actually, because I thought, I can't work next to this woman without saying something, and because she was, it would, like, whenever she would see me, she would be, like, scared, like, you know, and, um, and uh, so I was given a, basically a reprieve, because I continued, I couldn't stay at the next day meeting, and this and that, and they said, well, you have choice. You can either stop drinking or you can clean out your desk. Well, I knew I needed to pay my mortgage and a car payment. And so I took up opiates instead because I figured you couldn't smell them. And, um, and that took me down real fast. That took me down faster than the alcohol. And, uh, and when I came into the rooms, my, my nephew was at CDRP and he introduced me to AA, which I thought was going to be uh, a room full of old men. And, um, because my grandfather was an alcoholic and I thought that just old men that live, you know, were grandfathers that were alcoholics. I, I didn't know. And, and, um, but I heard something that night in the, in that room. And my first meeting was on the uh, 21st of January and, and, um, the room was full and there was big books. And I thought there were Bibles and I thought, you know, the daily reflections and all of that. And, um, I just heard something and, and I, I went back. They said, just come back. And, and um, these gals circled some meetings. And so I went back, and, and I got a sponsor. And, I, and um, I just knew whatever was going on in here, they weren't drinking. And, and I thought that, how are they living? Like, how, how, how are people, like, surviving? And 
like they introduced me to softball, sober softball. We'd have movie night. And I was like, you guys aren't drinking? Like, we're not using anything? I mean, we were smoking cigarettes like they were going out of style, but, you know, that was okay. <laughs> and um, and so I just began working the steps and, and taking the steps with another uh, sober woman. And um, my life started to change. You know, I started to have a little bit of uh, serenity in my life, a little bit of I don't know what it was, but I just felt better. I was able to get up and not be hung over. And I wasn't doing the chase, you know, because I would wake up before I was uh, found AA that, um, you know, I, I never knew if I, when I woke up, if I was going to have enough, if I was going to have enough money to, to get enough and if it was going to last. And that went on every day. And, and today I, I get the concept of one day at a time because it was one day at a time in my addiction for sure. I mean, if I got enough for the day, it was like, my day's good, you know? And, uh, now I don't have that problem, but I still have a lot of, uh, addictive behaviors and, uh, a thinking problem. And most days I can say that they're good as long as I stay in the solution, but I get the buckets. And, uh, and today I, I, I did do a, a 30 minute quiet time, which, you know, I try and sit with myself and it was really hard. It was really hard just to sit with my thoughts. And one of the things that I have to tell myself in my quiet time is that I have enough. I do enough. I am enough and I'm smart enough. Because I have a, I, I forget, you know, that I, I think because I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and that's my life sometimes. Like I think, poor me, you know, how come I can't have a little of that, or I come, I can't have a, little, especially around the holidays, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I've taken a stand with my family. I've set some boundaries, and it's the first year I've set boundaries with my family, and it was really hard because I've always been kind of the center of their whatever it is that they, they do. And, uh, so, you know, I, I'm really grateful that I'm sober today and abstinent. And, um, and I know that this will pass. I know it will. I know that, you know, I only have today, as long as I stay in the solution, as long as I keep coming to meetings and not get lazy with my program and, um, and really I need to, you know, talk to my higher power and just remember that, you know, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And, um, that I've heard that they, that somebody says that God never gives you too much. And I believe that. And, but my addict thinking thinks my life is coming to an end. I have cancer because my stomach hurts. Mm. I have to go to the hospital and they're going to tell me, you know, it's just like, come on enough. <laughs> You know, I have a good life today, and um, I lost my job in, in sobriety and um, of 12 years, and I became a full-time student, and uh, so that's kind of tough being with people much younger than myself, and uh, but learning, you know, I'm learning. I didn't realize that I could still learn in my 50s. <laughs> I thought I was done. <laughs> And, uh, but it's, it's definitely challenging. And, um, another thing that, um, I did this year on, uh, on Friday, which is very abnormal for me is I usually spend a lot of money at the mall. I put a lot of money into the economy on Friday and this year <laughs> I gave my time to the Re Richmond rescue mission. And, uh, and that was, that was good, but you know what, for the grace of God, there go I, you know, it's just a matter of it could, you know, and, um, and I was tired when I left. So anyway, I think my time is up and, uh, thank you everyone. I think my, it went out. Hey y'all, Tobias, alcoholic. Hi, Tobias. Um, yeah, Nikki called me this morning and asked me to speak at this meeting. And, um, of course I had, a lot of excuses why I shouldn't speak, you know, and I, I gave him one of them, which was that I had a secretary a meeting earlier, and I didn't think I'd be able to make it here in time, you know, and uh, after, you know, I said, but maybe, and after I got off the phone with them, I felt, I felt like, shit, I felt so bad, because we're not supposed to do that. We're always supposed to say yes, 
And I just, you know, um, it's funny, the last, over the last few weeks, I've been missing meetings. I've just been having a lot of other stuff that I've been doing that's keep, that's kept me away. You know, the holidays are a crazy time for me at work, and I've been feeling so, um, we get squirrely when we don't show up, you know. So, you know, one of the reasons why I felt so sad is because, you know, my higher power or whatnot was, was telling me that, that I'm supposed to do it, and I need to get my ass to this meeting and, and, and do my deal, you know. So... I called him back and I, I asked him if he had found anybody and I was so happy when he said no. <laughs> so here I am. You know, it's like, well, here we are. Um, like I said, my name is Tobias and I'm an alcoholic and um, I've been sober since 2009, uh, August 2nd. Um, so that's nine, uh, sorry, yeah, nine, t- sorry, <laughs> 2009, August 2nd. So that's nine years. And I have a sponsor. Um, that works with me in uh, uh, AA and also another program. And I currently have two sponsees and I have three commitments. And um, it's really important that I say that and have those things because I cherish all that. You know, got to keep, keep your foot in the door with service. It's so important. Um, you know, I, it was just uh, Thanksgiving a couple days ago, and um, I'm always I'm always a little afraid because I have so many memories of so many horrible Thanksgivings. You know, just being severely hungover or drinking too much, and just not being present for my family, lying, and just um, just having it be a real awkward thing. But that was how my life was all the time. I was always in this stuck in this feeling of of shame and guilt and trying to people please to adjust it to get it right and just it was always out of sync and always fucked up you know and um you know the years that i've been sober i've been showing up just a little bit more a little bit more of me's been showing up because i'm getting to know myself a little bit more you know and last and and just a couple days ago um sitting around with everyone and feeling totally, you know, at peace with just the silence in the room and, and the ability to ask people who I've known for years what they were doing on, in, in their, in their youth on Thanksgiving, you know, stories that I'd never heard and things that I never would have imagined, you know, came out of these people. And it just, it's just a shame <laughs> that I never knew these stories before. I, I, I never heard this stuff, you know, and it's another thing that, this program gives us is the ability to listen and learn and be present and just it gives life a whole different dimension so i left you know thanksgiving just feeling just uh, it wasn't about me you know it's about showing up and just um being um being up in it and um and it's great to see that people can see that i'm just there just like them showing up and uh, having a great experience a warm experience so it's been great to um, be close to my family in ways that I've never been before. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny how we all, a lot of us, when we share, we talk about, you know, our first experience um, with drugs or alcohol, you know, and how, you know, prior to that, our lives were, were pretty unmanageable just in terms of, like, being able to be present or all this discomfort and, and trying to find your place and awkwardness socially and all these things that, that we list, you know, and then we have our first hit of, of whatever. And then, you know, the angels sing and we're all of a sudden able to, you know, start talking our true feelings, you know, or, and get some attention and, you know, all the things that happen to us when we first start, you know, for me, um, I grew up, I was born in San Francisco with um, my father and my mom. My dad was a, um, I guess he was a childhood uh, prodigy priest from Texas and had married my mom from New York. My mom's from New York. They met um, in New Mexico, eventually got married and had me and my dad being the, you know, the guy that he was and my mom being a beatnik um, from you know, all kinds of cool, just history there. Um, and my dad was kind of getting into the whole, he had been like in the, in the war, I guess he had been in a, the thing called LSD 25 or something like that, where he was a, an experiment for, for acid in the war. 
and um, it kind of twisted his brain up. So by the time he got with my mom, he was already kind of like had a taste of of that uh, that lifestyle. He was already kind of getting into it um, just with uh, the whole beatniks thing and and just whatnot. So with with him and her, um, he started getting into drugs again um, in San Francisco and started, um, I don't know if he was pra practicing Satanism or black magic, but he went from one extreme to the other and started to lose it with my mom and apparently was was very abusive to her and, and of course, uh, cheating. Um, and so I didn't see any of that. I was too young to be able to really know what was going on. I just know it was all blurry. I had a couple cool toys, you know. Um, I remember he uh, liked to smash his peas, you know, at the dinner table. That's kind of, <laughs> that was a thing, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, you know, eventually I had a sister who died of, um, who, who was born and then eventually died at a young age of leukemia. So my mom, you know, with the combination of my dad's um, changing and being like the, the crazy person he was and my sister dying, she took me and, and we bailed and moved to Berkeley um, where I um, lived with her and with my and my grandmother. And so what happened uh, there was my mom was in so much pain and was so uh, distraught that it was really hard for her to kind of um, give me the attention that I needed at the time. You know, so I was uh, around a lot of sadness. And, you know, growing up, I felt like I was doing pretty good as a kid. You know, I was able to go to school and and be somewhat present and be excited about stuff. And, um, and eventually my mom, uh, I, I had another sister. And, um, you know, we lived in Berkeley at the time in the 60s. So there was a lot of, a lot of, you know, partying going on. It was a crazy time. And we were up in it. You know, my mom was a really in a folk scene, a flamenco scene. There was like a band playing next door. It was kind of, it was very wild. And, um, you know, so I was exposed to a lot of that as a kid, you know. So I, apparently I was told, I was, you know, that we lived next door to a commune where there was all these people taking care of me. I spent a lot of time there. Everybody was either doing speed or, or coke or, or acid or whatever and smoking a lot of weed. And my mom just kind of let me hang out over there. So... You know, apparently I was given acid at a really young age and smoking weed and just hanging out in this in this house, you know. Um, eventually, someone, like, broke into our house and tried to kill my mom uh, with a hammer, and it was uh, devastating for me to have somebody just break into the house and try and murder my mom for no apparent reason. There was no connection mm -hmm. to the, the beating, like, with anything other than it was just random and an act of violence. So, um, once again, um, a thing, a sad thing happened to me, you know, and, um, from there, uh, it was really hard for me to like go to school. Like I, I, I witnessed part of this beating and, um, it, it kind of put me into a state of shock and I started to detach from school a lot, you know, and, um, was very shut down and spent a lot of time at the at the hippie house, the commune, and a couple of other people were taking care of me at the time. My mom was not supposed to make it, but she did. And um, so, you know, like I was outcasting myself or I was outcasted from all the events that had happened. And, um, you know, it wasn't until um, later that I, you know, I, I started dressing strange. I started getting into fantasy situations with comic books and and believe in and drawing and feeling very much a part of that whole outer outer realm of of um, just life, you know, wanting to escape all the time. So you know um, that that was my you know um, invitation to to kind of uh, to what later became you know drugs and alcohol is just to escape and feel good, you know. Um, I eventually started dressing so weird that I was picked on all the time. I'd wear my mom's, you know, far out boots, you know, and, and Batman outfits and like eye patches and fringe vests and 
just because it felt no that to me felt normal, you know, because I was loving the fantasy stuff that I was into. And I didn't really have anybody telling me not to do it. It was like <laughs> people were making me shit, you know. So um so I would get my ass kicked a lot in school just for being such a freak. You know, it was kind of I was in a tough school. And it wasn't until later that I started to fight back and get a little bit of popularity through uh acts of violence that were from me, you know, and I started to hang with people that accepted me for being a freak and a wild guy. And um and that eventually led me to drinking, you know, and drinking um at an early age was a way it I don't I remember sitting on a porch drinking cold duck at a at a block party thing and just I could not stop laughing. It just felt so good to laugh like to, around people. I had never really experienced that like that before. And if I could do that and, and just hang out, you know, with these other kids and they were doing the same thing, I felt like I finally found my people, you know. So, you know, going to school at a young age didn't really consist of going to school. Later on, it consisted of trying to find those outcasts and people that I could laugh with and be and talk of other stuff other than, you know, what was going on at school, what was going on in their life. I needed to be around people like myself to feel... um to feel that bond and feel closeness. Um, and I did that and I stopped going to school and I continued to drink and I continued to try and up my game with my friends. Like, you know, I tried to get, hang around with the tougher guy or just cause it gave me a sense of, of, of being just more cool, you know, or just being, I don't know, whatever, more popular, you know? So I would hang out with that guy and I would do crazy shit. And I started to get really, crazy with all that stuff, you know, um, drinking, doing drugs and breaking into houses and stealing cars. And, and the thing that sucked is that my heart was never into it. You know, I always had, a, I've always had this kind of milky soft heart and I tried so hard to get as fucked up as possible to like push myself to hang around with the cool people. Cause I've always just, once again, it was kind of like superheroes and fantasy. And here I was, um, you know, breaking into houses and doing all and fighting, and I always got caught. You know, I just because I just, I just kind of did everything half-ass. You know, and so I started getting t- taken to these little jail jailing things, having all these experiences. You know, um, and uh, in 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 little jail situations like that wasn't quite juvenile hall. I wasn't quite ready for that yet because I hadn't quite done enough shit to get to that level, but. I wasn't getting caught for the big stuff until later, you know, um, and eventually, you know, I, I did and went to juvenile hall and got this shit scared out of me. I got kind of scared straight a little bit. I was like, you know, I had, a, I had to spend three weeks or four weeks not drinking. So I started to feel stuff and, you know, and I got really, I got, I, it started to clear, clear me up a little bit. So eventually, um, there's so much to talk about and I just, I have a tendency to just blah blah on so um it's kind of fun though right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so um i i've always been a music i've always grew up around music and been a big big fan and i had a musical family and eventually i was um i was introduced to um the drums and played drums um during that kind of messy time but when i got out of juvenile hall i kind of started to gear uh, veer more towards that and learning how to play drums and getting more into art. And I still did all the partying and stuff, but I finally had a play, like another place that was kind of like home. You know, being creative and having an outlet and being able to beat the shit out of something felt really good. And I started to see people different and I started to hear things different. And just, I wasn't really, it t- takes a while to get good, but I was even worse when I was drinking. Like I just wasn't a good drummer when I drank. Maybe when I smoked a little weed, you know, I, I thought I was a little better, but, um, so I, I kind of honed down the drinking a little bit and eventually got into playing music and I did that for a real long time and I to- started toning things down. I got girlfriends and I still did drugs on the weekend and had jobs and, you know, I mean, it was, it, it was an okay life, but I wasn't doing anything about the drinking and using that, that I was doing, which was still quite a lot, um, but not like every goddamn day in the morning, you know, like it used to be. Um, and I eventually got married and had a kid and was introduced to um, crystal meth. 
at the age of, of maybe 29 or 30. Yeah, uh, and um, that took me away for about 13 years. I didn't. I had no idea that it just the first time I did that stuff. Everything it was like a godsend. Every earth stood still. Everything made sense. I could do everything so well and so fast and so clear. And I could make my point, and I could make some amends, and I could clean the house, and I could drum faster than you, and I could just, uh, you know, I could do all this shit that I, you know, for about a week it lasted, you know, in terms of it being good, until, you know, you start picking at your skin, and, and the paychecks start to, you know, like, get into, like, you want an advance, so you could, like, get fronted, and just, I mean, not, not fronted, but you get fronted money, so you could go get... S- cops and some stuff and it basically uh, took me it seriously took me out for a long time and I didn't drink during that time I just did meth and like I was raising I eventually had a kid and got sober and I had this horrible relationship with my ex-wife and me and um, I mean I raised the kid pretty much on my own for two and a half years my ex-wife had postpartum depression and uh, just kind of shut herself uh, away and, and isolated while I did a lot of work. So meth helped me in that sense that I was able to do a lot. And um, I actually was a, somewhat of a decent father. Eventually, um, the postpartum less, led to more depression, and she asked to um, to go back home to Scotland to get better. And um, I got the money together and... Um, helped her leave you know and she left with the kid and uh was supposed to come back in like three weeks and never came back so she hasn't been back since so i got back into drugs and and spun out of control to a point where you know i was like 120 pounds and just i just couldn't function i was not functioning i was able to hold a job and i was able to manipulate things to work just right for me but i was almost dying, you know, and I was heartbroken. Um, things with music were going well, but that was, everything else was a disaster, you know. So that, um, that led me into, uh, people started, uh, at work started noticing that I was a wreck and offered me, uh, some help, which in the form of rehab, and I had never experienced any, um, any type of 12 steps or any type of meetings or anything like that. Um, some people tried to get me to go to them a couple times and I, I, I just couldn't, there was no way, you know, I was going to do that. So, um, you know, I was at such a, such a bottom that I decided to try it, you know, and I finally was able to talk with my family about, you know, about where, I I mean, they knew what was happening and the, and the fact that they knew that there was a potential help for me, um, they were, they supported me and I got all this support and love, you know, it's like finally, you know, it's like step one, admitting that I was a fucking alcoholic or a drug addict. I start just then I started to get love that I hadn't experienced in a long time because I was actually being a little bit honest about how fucked up I was. I was high, I was lying, you know, for so many years. So I went into, um, what's the one called over there on the hill <laughs> that we all go to? Huh? No, keep going. No, MPI. God, I'm so bad. I'm. I'm <laughs> I went to MPI, and it was um, it was great. You know, I, I the 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 day I do I get sober now. It's perfect timing, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. Because I'm just starting to get sober, and he whips out a thing that says 20 minutes, and it says get sober underneath it. And I, and geez, man, great time, impeccable time. You're running tight shit. That's funny. Yeah. Let's say that. Get sober. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So, um, anyway, so MPI, the minute I went uh, into MPI, you know, they drug test you and they give you, lo- I was prescribed antidepressants right away, taking the edge off, you know, and all this stuff. And, and, uh, I had been in therapy before, and I was lying in therapy all the time about my sobriety and, and just, you know, so I wasn't really getting, there was no nothing happening with my therapist because I wasn't being honest. You know, it was all about my, well, all kinds of other stuff, you know. Um, 
so to get real and MPI was um was pretty groundbreaking for me to like sit with a counselor, sit in rooms and start to discuss feelings and uh hear from other men about their feelings and about their their struggles, you know, which is something that I um struggled with because I wasn't getting any, I didn't have any the bonds that I had were were poor me and I'm fucked up, let's do some drugs, not poor me, I'm fucked up, let's try and get better and help each other, you know, which is um which is what I started to get in in those in that in the rooms there. And, um, you know, so that started to lead me into, um, becoming a little bit honest and, and hearing some stuff about step work, you know, and, um, you know, I, I graduated from, I mean, I was outpatient there for a month, so it wasn't really a long stretch. Um, and I started to go to meetings, you know, um, during that time I went to NA And, um, you know, I was just, I was so nervous and so scared and sat in the back and I never experienced anything like it except for that month in in MPI. And, um, it took me a while to get a sponsor there and I finally did. And it was somebody that I thought was cool and we worked the steps, you know, and I had never done anything like that in my life. I had never finished school. I had never... I was not good at homework and I'd always sped through everything. And this guy was a a musician and, and we connected and started taking me some really cool meetings where I met some really cool people, you know? Um, and so I basically stayed sober with him for about nine months and I, I jumped the gun a little too, I mean, I did the steps so quickly in NA. And I jumped the gun a little too quickly and started playing music. It started, and, and through, it had been a while back that I started becoming a singer, like a rock singer. So, um, which was a, a, you know, completely fucked up environment for someone who's trying to get sober. And I, I jumped the gun and joined this amazing band. Um, you know, early on, well, I had nine months. I thought it was enough to start rocking out, you know, and, um, a couple, uh, there was only maybe about two or three gigs in, and I thought I was, you know, sober, and I, I, I'm doing great, and I saw a beer, and it was just, it talked to me, you know, it just said, come sip on this, dude, you're working your ass off, you're sober, you know, you're, you're singing what you're doing well, you deserve, I mean, I see this frosty motherfucking beer at the side of the stage, and I thought, you know what, I'm not doing speed, this is not a relapse, this is okay. This is going to be okay. My sponsor was actually my band manager, which was really funny. And he didn't stop. He didn't even know, you know, so I drank that beer and kind of hit it. And I was just like, I was a kid again, except I was drinking, you know, and I wasn't doing speed. I wasn't running to a corner to hide and do my little weird porno thing. I was actually, (laughs) you know, drinking beer with dudes and, and I was a rock singer and it, I'd never felt that good. You know, so it was like, oh, my God, I get to be this guy now, you know, and I did. I was that guy for, you know, for that minute. <laughs> and and I, I I took that. I I rode that sucker hard for five years. I mean, I, all the the little mousy shit I did and, and fucked up shit I did to, as, to myself as a speed addict was nothing compared to the wreckage that I caused in the five years that I, you know, drank. You know, I cheated, I fucked stuff up, I was disgusting, I, all the stuff that when we get really nasty, I had a huge ego, and, um, and I just, I, I couldn't, I wasn't that good at drinking. Like, I would drink and I would need cocaine, eventually cocaine came into the picture, or I always needed something, and my hangovers were brutal. So it was this vicious cycle of, like, you know, um, Drinking and feeling horrible and thinking I had buddies who I could drink with in the daytime. So it wasn't, and I could be out, you know, it's public. You can go, it's not illegal to drink. So I'm going to take this puppy and do it. You know, we're going to drink in the daytime and it's going to be cool. We're cool. You know, we're, we're misfits. And once again, hanging on to this whole ideology of what I thought was, was hipster cool at the time. And, uh, you know, 
I, I just was a really bad drinker and I could not stop, you know, anytime I do anything, it's all or nothing, you know? And, um, I mean, we would go out to, we would drink all night and have breakfast the next morning and there'd be, you know, some, some, maybe some drinking, but I was just like, why even order breakfast? You know, why can't we just start drinking? You know, this is ridiculous. And I just remember every day was kind of like that for me. You know, so it got really bad, and um, I just became worse with my family, worse with everything. And um, do I got at least 10 minutes left, right? Yeah, 14. Good. And so um, so what had started to happen at that time is that my, um, my sister was uh, diagnosed with cancer and um, at the time, and um, it was... I was getting phone calls about her diagnosis all the time and um, was not answering the phone a lot most of the time because I was too hungover and too uh, just too fucked up. And eventually I got so sick of myself that I decided to start um, to try and go to meetings to show up for my sister and my family. And um, so I, I started to get myself back into the rooms, but I tried AA this time. And there was, I'm not, you know, I have all, all kinds of respect for NA, but, um, AA at the times, you know, had spoke to me in, in ways there was more people, more meetings. Um, it's where I was at and it's what I needed. And, um, you know, it took me years of relapses and sitting in the back and being, um, that guy, you know, um, and, and, and a, and a few sponsors to, um, be able to start to get just the basic fundamentals of the steps, you know, um, with, uh, it, yeah, it was, it's really hard being a newcomer and lying and re and, get, and getting to that whole fucking cycle of relapsing. It's so hard to get a day, two days a week, you know, uh, I just was at, so uncomfortable all the time and it, it took time you know i um it, it you know I, I got a sponsor my first sponsor was like you need to make this many phone calls a day you need to do 90 and 90 you need to read the big book and you need you know all these things i did not connect with at the time i needed a hug i needed a big fat hug and i needed a different approach and i wasn't getting it so i was taking my big book and and drinking vodka and thinking I was like nailing it. You know, I couldn't remember anything I highlighted the next day when I would call my sponsor. And of course I told him I was sober. So I was just, it was all bad. There was a point where things got worse for me and my sister. And, um, I ran into an old friend who was a musician who was in the program and I don't know what happened to me. I, I basically something happened and I dropped to my knees and I begged him for help. I just, um, and I wasn't even looking for him. It just happened, you know, and he took me the next day to a meeting where there was musicians and people like myself. And, um, I got something at that meeting that I had never, that I'd, I had never gotten before. And, um, I actually, that he became my sponsor and, um, he took me through the steps in a way that I didn't know was possible, which was the way he had gone through the steps, which is kind, kind and, and compassionate and loving and being able to work with me on my level, you know, for someone who didn't go to school and was, was intimidated by books and things. He, uh, explained a lot of things to me in a creative way to the point where I got it, you know, and I, I, I did, um, okay. You know, so my first round of steps was, was with this gentleman and, um, I, don't know if I had, um, if I had, when we became so close, I had to find it eventually, uh, find another sponsor. He, he promised me if I got three months that we could record a song together. It was just that kind of a relationship. It was freaking beautiful. I mean, if it wasn't for him, I don't know. But eventually I, I, um, had a, a relapse after a year sober and it lasted a day. And, um, it's just funny how it just happens. It just happened. And, you know, I, and I realized through the next bout of, of, uh, my sobriety that I hadn't been taking any service commitments. I didn't have a sponsee. I, um, what else? I just didn't do a thorough 
job on the steps. You know, I kind of skipped through it just to get through it. And um, I started to, I started working with a different sponsor and he took me to a different place with the steps. We read the big book in a way that I had never done before, slowly, thoroughly. And um, he told me that early on that I needed to get a sponsee. And um, I remember it was so hard for me to, to find a sponsee at the time. I was so nervous about it. And I remember going to Newbridge and being told that I didn't have enough time to sponsor anyone. You know, because I only had a couple months, and I just was like, "This sucks, man." You know, this is really hard. I don't know. I I must have been kind of half-assed, going about it kind of half-assed, but I didn't feel like I was ever going to be ready to be a sponsor. And finally, I became one, and it's probably the coolest thing that's ever one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. You get a whole nether like foray into the steps when you start sponsoring people because you start all over again. And you want to do good, and you actually freaking care more about giving than you ever have in forever, however long it's been. So having that connection with another dude and being able to take this person through the steps and actually starting to get commitments and confidence in the program just by showing up and just trying stuff has really, um, it took my sobriety to the next level. Next thing I was secretary meetings, you know, started off doing the little stuff and secretary and being so scared and nervous through the whole process. And you guys held my hand through it, you know, all the time, always, still do, you know. And here I am with you all right now, just, and it's your faces and you guys being here that's allowing me to feel comfortable doing this, you know, just, that's what AA does, you know. So, you know, um, I, I, it's at one point I had gotten to the point where I had six sponsees and I was going and tons of commitments and going to so many meetings and realizing that, um, I kind of, I thought I tapped, like topped, I just was basically wearing like a chain, you know, I didn't feel like I was seriously getting into my heart and soul. Like I, like the promises say you're supposed to get like this, you know, supposed to get into this whole other level of living in life and being at peace and I just was trying to like have tons of shit and be cool with AA and so what I started to do was um I you know I I started looking for another sponsor and um at this time or I just for some reason it was time for another sponsor and I was at this point where I had all this stuff and um he uh he heard me and he told, he told, he, we got into some discussion about another program and about abandonment issues that I had and, and all these things that reflected to my childhood. And we went through the step. I went through the steps with him. Like I've not, I feel like I went and to like Yoda planet and spent all this time in outer space with this dude who showed me the real way of AA and recovery. And one of the reasons I wanted to, was looking for the sponsor was so I could give more back to my sponsees and be of better service to myself and, and find that place in me that was empty. And through the process with him, I've been doing so much writing and inventory work that I've never, stuff I've never looked at before and, and started meditating and praying and doing proper 10 steps and doing all the stuff that we do like on, a, on another level, you know, and it's changed me so much. I mean, I, I don't believe the stuff I've, I've, I have now, which is basically just my presence and being able to feel things and see things as they are and feel the love and give love um, that I didn't think was possible from me, you know, and a lot of that is just from being still and not trying to do so much and pay attention to my feelings and write about them and talk about them and, and, um, do the right thing and pausing and, you know, doing just all the stuff that we get to do. You know, we get to do that. When I have a, a fucked up day, I always, it takes me a while to realize that, um, I get to like go home and write a 10 step on whatever incident happened throughout my day that caused me pain and anxiety and I get to, to write it and then I get to meditate on it and log it and let it go, you know, and, um, I, every day I get to do that and it works. 
and then I get to talk with my sponsor or with you guys about it. You know, I mean, it's just a this family that we have is is unimaginable and beautiful, and it's it's very dreamy and overwhelming just how how badass it is to me. So, um, you know, I don't know how much more time I have. Three minutes, um, or what? Uh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Did you guys feel like you got a little Tobias there? Did? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I could go through my notes and be like, oh, you know. Um, no, I did that. News and responses. I'm working. Yeah, I, I think I, I, drugs, daughter, wife, daughter, drugs. And I, I did it all, man. Relapse. I, I got. I'm done. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.